Thanks so much for having me here tonight. Um, to start with, a lot of what I'm going to talk about comes back to who I am as well. So who I am is occasionally Dr. Louise Byrne, although as my brother and sister keep reminding me, I'm not a real doctor and I'd be useless on an airplane if someone had a heart attack. Um, I'm a beloved daughter, partner, sister, friend. I have a wealth of people who define me and, and I sit in different roles with. Um, I'm a musician. I've been playing in bands for over 25 years. I am a person who likes creativity and nature and animals and I'm also a person who has had and continues to have significant mental health challenges, who has used services including periods of hospitalisation and experiences periods of healing, which is not to say that it's always good but there are times when it is. Um, so thinking about the focus of my talk, I was thinking about the work that I've done since 2005 in a range of lived experience roles. In all of those roles, I was employed specifically to work from the perspective of my lived experience of mental health challenges, of what it's like to use services, of what it's like to be hospitalised, um, and of what it's like to experience healing periodically. Um, and what I was trying to encapsulate or trying to capture was what, what was the most important thing? Like I've got this, this opportunity to tell people the big thing that I've learnt. And what I realised was that the big thing that I'd learnt wasn't in the, you know, what is it, 12 years um, that I've spent working in lived experience roles. It wasn't in the seven years now that I've spent in lived experience mental health research. It was a combination of those things but it also included my own healing, very importantly, my own journey of healing. So um, with that in mind, I'd like to just take you back to where it all began, um, which is in the early 90s in a small Queensland town, very much like this one, so much like it, in fact, that it, it was this town. Um, <laughs> I was diagnosed with a serious mental illness at a time when mental illness was not well understood or talked about. Um, my behaviours, like many people who were suffering from stress and distress and from trauma, was not always easy for other people to understand and it wasn't always pleasant for them to see. Um, I was very much misunderstood and the label that I was given told me a story about myself and told other people a story about me that was incredibly limiting and damaging. Um, it was an idea about myself that I, that I took inside and really absorbed. Um, it was also an idea that a lot of people around me, sadly, took on too much as well. I remember at high school being that psycho kid, you know, as kids do. Um, I was ostracised, um, I was, I guess, defamed, I was quite well known for some of my hijinks, and um, I was poorly thought of by a lot of people, including myself. In my mid-teens, I left and I began a new life in a bigger place and I was very fortunate that I came across a group of people who, that were very welcoming and accepting of difference. It was a place that I thrived in and it was a group of people that I felt accepted and allowed to be myself. Um, over the next decade or so, I was fortunate enough to gain my master's degree in um, media production. Um, play in lots of bands, have um, a great interesting life and a collection of friends that really meant a lot to me. In my mid-twenties, I was so optimistic, I was so positive and feeling so confident about my, my life chances and my future that I quit smoking and I quit drinking and pretty quickly things went massively downhill. Uh, like a lot of people with trauma and um, complex life stories, those things were the best screen between me and my pain. I had just bucket loads, cupboards full, you know, uh, buildings full of pain that was waiting, waiting to emerge. And I didn't know what to do with it when it did come out. And so, yeah, things got, got pretty bleak. And I ended up back in psychiatric hospital, but this time as an adult having built everything and lost everything, it, it felt very different. Um, I was in hospital for over three months and by the end of that time I was physically so unwell and mentally so unwell. Um, my mum had to dr do the long drive down to that bigger city and, and pick me up and bring me home. And as a result, I lost my long-term partner who I loved dearly. I lost the house that we'd bought together. I lost the great job I had at a university. I lost all my friends who I thought of as my family. I lost my life and probably most importantly, I lost hope. 
I lost hope um, that I was ever going to defy the odds, that I was ever going to be able to transcend that diagnosis, that label, that concept that I had been given of myself and I thought, okay, this is it, this is it for me. Um, it was very bleak and it took me years to recover. I spent a long time essentially sitting in a back room at my mum's house and I, I couldn't drive, couldn't um, really leave the house much. I certainly couldn't work. I didn't have any kind of social life to speak of. Um, and to understand why things were so bleak for me is to understand that idea that had been imprinted in me about who I was, what I was capable of and what my life would be like. And um, that idea was common and, and still is unfortunately common. It's a traditional concept of mental health. It's, it's how we viewed mental health for a long time, with a deficits focus, with a focus on symptoms, with a focus on what is wrong with the individual rather than what has happened to that individual. It's a focus on managing something and trying to um, try to keep somebody safe, I guess, from themselves as well as from everything else. And that deficit's focus, that um, idea that there's something intrinsically wrong that you have to manage, is incredibly limiting. So what saved me, what allowed me to transcend all of this, was being introduced to lived experience concepts of mental health. And lived experience concepts of mental health were championed by people like me who had been through the system, who had been told that they were somehow less than, who had come to believe that and then defied that prognosis and defied those odds and gone on to create a life of choice and meaning for themselves, a life that was self-defined. And they came back to the system and they came back in so many numbers that the system started to scratch its head and think, well, maybe we have got it wrong. Maybe mental health isn't chronic and unremitting and maybe we don't have to focus on deficits and maybe there is something else. Um, lived experience workers like me work in a range of positions. I have worked in peer support, which is one-on-one -on -one and sometimes group work, where you walk with someone in their journey. Um, systemic advocacy positions are very popular, particularly in very large mental health organisations and with government, and those positions allow the policy and the planning of the organisation to take on these lived experience concepts at, at its most, um, I guess at the, the most basic level. Um, teaching and research, which is what I've done for the last seven years. What we're hoping to see over the next few years and what is already emerging in some areas is lived experience roles outside of the mental health sector. So we're thinking emergency services, schools, hospitals, um, general hospitals, anywhere where people might be affected by mental health and hey, that's everywhere. That's, that's, that's over half of us in this room in our lifetime. So why lived experience concepts are so different? Um, I guess it starts with the power differentials. It starts with the fact that when I talk with and walk with somebody um, who also has a lived experience and is currently accessing mental health services, I'm not coming from that position of the, the expert, of the uh, formal knowledge of representing the organisation or the system. I'm someone who, like them, has been marginalised. I'm someone who, like them, has lost a sense of citizenship, of personhood, who has lost friends, who's lost partners, who's lost employment. So I understand what it's like to feel like I'm less than, like I'm other, like I'm different in a not so good way. And just being around as a lived experience person helps to address the power imbalance that you know, whether wittingly or unwittingly exists between mental health service users and the service system itself. Uh, lived experience workers can come from a place of mutuality. So I, again, can sit with somebody else who is experiencing challenges at the moment and I can challenge them in ways that it might not be appropriate for somebody else to challenge them. I can be like, hey, yeah, but you know, I remember when I got really stuck in my patient identity and I started to get really digging into my own hopelessness. You know, there was a little bit of whatever, you know, in that for me and they can sort of go, hey, yeah, all right, yeah, I hear what you're saying. These are, these are conversations you can't have with somebody if you haven't been there because if you're trying to talk to somebody in that way when you haven't been there yourself, it can go, the, it can go in the wrong direction, it can be disempowering and it can take away from connection. Connection's another really big one. So lived experience practitioners or lived experience workers understand connection, understand the essential need for connection. Connection with each other, connection to self, connection with your idea of the divine, connection to nature. And we understand how to foster connection, how to address the fact that there's a lack of connection and to work on that. We work on that in a range of ways. I guess, I think hope is probably 
the core issue for lived experience work. And uh, there was a great lived experience pioneer, Pat Deegan, once said that hope for people like us who are having significant challenges with their mental health is a matter of life and death, which in fact it is. Because it's the difference between, yes, I'm going to get up this morning and I'm going to try, and no, I'm going to check out because I just can't go on anymore. And when somebody walks with you from the perspective of their lived experience, they can share stories of hope, sure. But I think at its, at its essence, the fact that they exist is an example of hope. They're a living example of hope. They're there. And they're not only there, they're not there still struggling. They might still be struggling, but they're not just still struggling. They're also there being recognised for their expertise. They're being recognised for what they can bring, the value that they can add to that situation. And they're telling you, hey, I've been there, and it can get better. And it might get worse again, but it might get better again too. So they're giving you something essential that's hope, that, that probably can't come in quite the same way from any other place. Um, coming from a place of hope is also essential. I trained in intentional peer support with an incredible woman, Sherry Mead, and she talked about coming from a place of hope instead of a place of fear. And when we come from a place of hope, everything we do is energised by that hope. When we come from a place of fear, when we interact with people from a place of fear, our body language, the words that we use, everything about that interaction is poisoned by that fear. And it is absolutely incredible. It, it's, it's incredible the difference that it can make when you're able to hope for and believe in someone's capacity to heal, when you sit with them from that place as opposed to a place of fear and being risk averse and worrying about them. Being there, um, doing with instead of for, understanding that essentially that other person is going to have their own answers, not trying to fix, because that's one of the big problems that we have. Um, if you do have mental health challenges, everyone around you is trying to fix things for you. And what you do when you solve a problem for someone with a mental health challenge is you reiterate the fact that they're not able to do for themselves. You further disempower. Nothing good comes of that except for you in that moment, that feel-good moment. But for that person, all you've done is taken something else away in terms of their confidence in themselves. Autonomy is a huge one. Empathy is a huge one. It's very difficult to understand what it's like to be ostracised. It's very difficult to understand what it's like to be in a position where your liberty may be taken from you without committing a crime, where somebody has the right to administer drugs that can leave you senseless for days at a time, to lock you up, to restrain you. It's very difficult to walk those roads empathetically with another person unless you have been there. And a lived experience worker is able to do that and to do it effectively. Um, so. Sharing stories, I guess. Um, when, we, when, when we share a story, uh, we, we get to a point where the other person feels that they have permission to share their story. So lived experience um, allows not only the person to share part of their story, but they allow everyone around them to start to share some of their story. And I guess that's, to me, the key with this work. Anyone can do it. You might not be able to do it to the level. You might not be able to empathise to the degree that somebody might who has had a very similar experience to a service user. But we can all believe in other people. We can all hope for. We can all choose to connect with. We can all um, choose not to fix. We can all choose to believe that the other person has the capacity to do their own fixing. Um, and sh when we allow those things to happen, when we allow conversations to emerge about our mental health, I think that's when we're starting to look at transformational change. I don't actually believe that mental health is an individual issue. I don't think that mental health services, no matter how well funded or resourced, will ever reach the growing demand, the incredible need that we have as a society for mental health. But I do think that we as a community all have the capacity to contribute something. Um, I think that not only the hard times need to be discussed, but also the triumphs. Each one of us has faced mental health challenges in our lives. Um, and when we share our stories, both our sad stories, we allow someone else to know that they're not the only one. But when we share our triumphs, it's, we're just growing our knowledge, our collective understanding of how to beat it. It's tips. It's, um, it just makes sense. Um, I have a dream. And my dream is that one day I'll be able to go to my neighbour for a cup of sugar and advice on how they dealt with their anxiety. And I think that when we're able to do that as a society, when we're able to talk about mental health in those ways, then we're going to start to stem the tide of what is an epidemic. 
However, um, there are also limits. Um, we can't always be there for everyone. And um, in my own life recently, despite all my learnings and all the time that I've spent doing this work, I've lost several people um, who have died by suicide. I didn't have the answers for them. And there is no blanket answer or cure-all for the stress and distress that so many of us experience. But there is still one other huge contribution that we can make. Um, we may not be able to always be there for others. We may not always have the answers for them or, or know when to be there at the exact moment. But we can and we must show up for ourselves every day, every hour. And this is something that we're not encouraged to do. Socially, it's considered selfish to spend time and energy on yourself. And the reality is when you start to spend time and energy on yourself, it's mucky, it's muddy, it's dirty and it's hard. When you get down with yourself, you're really eyeballing yourself, what you find is you don't like a lot about who you are. But each one of us has to take responsibility for that. Because when you do, when you do wrestle yourself to the ground, when you do get in the mud, when you do show a willingness to understand and ultimately learn to accept yourself, what you're learning is compassion, you're learning kindness, you're learning forgiveness. And you're able to then give those things in your transactions to other people. So you're sharing that gift and it's growing and it's growing. You're able to sit in non-judgment. You're able to focus on the person and not their behavior. It is very hard work, but it's the clay that we have to work with. And I think that it's arduous work, but possibly the most significant contribution that we can make to our collective mental health. I'd just like to leave you with a concluding thought. I believe we become the change we want to see in the world by being the change we need within ourselves. Thank you.